Alright. Mic check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Duran, Max, Max Duran, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association Podcast. My name is Max Saron, and as always, looking across Canada and the world for the most interesting stories I can find. We are here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, as you can tell from my voice and all the conferences we've done on this wonderful show for the last two years, that this is the last day. Every last day of every conference we go to, I sound like I've been a jazz singer for 30 years, <laughs> but you know what? It works out. Today, I have the luxury and privilege of having Susan Crowley sitting here with me, who is the executive director of the CWB Welding Foundation. Susan, how are you doing? I'm good. It's a great morning here in Winnipeg, sun shining. 32 degrees today. (laughs) going. It's wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening here, you know, and, and what you're doing here and what your group is doing here. So, you know, what is skills to you personally? You know, Skills, this is my first time being at the National Skills Competition. And what really blows me away is the excitement and the engagement of all the students and and how they are being so supported by their teachers, mm-hmm. by their parents, by influencers. Um, and they're having a great time. And while some of them are kind of there for the t-shirt type of things. I would say there's so many of them that are being surprised by what they're finding out here. There's great information sharing. Yeah. There's opportunities to try things in a you know, no risk environment. And I think we're getting their interest in, in doing, doing more to learn about the trades. Uh, the, the camaraderie, the vibe, the, the inspiration that you can feel it's tangible in the air especially during like opening ceremonies where there's cheering and people going wild and you know it's a good time we were talking about it last night amongst the group of it of 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 the ntc's the national training coordinators last night about you know every instructor across canada that teaches anything in the trades it should almost be mandatory that they attend one national event because if you weren't inspired about skills and what they're doing and the, all the companies and sponsors and agencies and not-for-profits that support these events, mm-hmm. then you may not be cut out to be a trade instructor because <laughs> this is amazing. This is like the Olympics, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. this, I think, just motivates everyone to go back and do even more. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, just continuing to build that momentum and, you know, as we're all trying to do, change the narrative so that more students of all ages um or potential students Mm -hmm. are aware of the opportunities yeah that's you know as we have this skills gap work gap we're looking at demographics age we're looking at gender we're looking at marginalized groups we're looking at immigration we're looking at you know ex-convicts we're looking at anyone like we it's all hands on deck now right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so now with the foundation specifically Mm -hmm. You know, what's the objective and goal, you know, of being a partner of skills, you know, of being involved both financially, but manpower, like there's, you know, there's, there's feet on the street here, right? Yes. Well, you know, we are CWB, a remote first organization. Mm -hmm. And a big part of our role is building awareness of the opportunities in the trades, specifically welding, welding technologies, welding engineering, and it it keeps growing and growing and growing. And as you know, Max, so well, welding is a gateway trade to so many different careers. So for us as a foundation, I'm finding what's really powerful is being able to connect in person with students, teachers, um, competitors from across Canada Mm -hmm. and the organizations that are supporting them. Um, You know, we're meeting people from the Northwest Territories, yeah. from PEI, from everywhere and so in between. Happy to be here. <laughs> and they yeah, are. Yeah. And, you know, they're looking for opportunities just like we are. Mm-hmm. So those connections are, I think, really going to be great to go back to our desks mm-hmm. and, and continue then conversations. So. Yeah. The follow up, you know, it's a three day conference. You go to a three day conference 
and you come back with three months of work. That's right. <laughs> and, and first you need to rest and regroup a little bit because you you might have lost your voice. Oh, I lost my voice. Your feet got, might be sore. I think <laughs> so, I'm averaging about 26,000 steps a day right now. I bet you are. <laughs> well, that's good. One. That's good for me. It's good for the belly. So. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in terms of your teams, how do you organize who, you know, the different areas. So you got, you know, a booth down here with the women of steel. Mm -hmm. um, you got the booth upstairs in the welding, like close to the welding area. How do you decide, you know, how far you want to commit? How, you know, those lines. That's a great question. And we're also involved in the auto body, auto right, body right. repair yeah. competition, um, which is, as you know, a, a new area mm -hmm. uh, that CWB is going into. Um, and we're looking for other opportunities. Mm -hmm. So how do we decide, you know, Number one, we really wanted to do more this mm -hmm. year than we were able to do in the last few years, obviously. Yeah. Coming out of the pandemic, the demand for being able to, you know, reach us and us reach potential students and future welders uh, is greater than ever. Um, and people are excited to see and do things face to face. So in planning for this year's skills competitions across Canada, um, we really put a lot of emphasis on the national competition. Yeah. And then we look to get the support of our CWB partners and very much the association in uh, being involved in the, the regional and provincial competitions. And, you know, giving us that feedback that then we can do exactly as you said, go back, you know, debrief, mm -hmm. look at what worked, what didn't work as well, and what was different than what we expected, yeah. and then plan really comprehensively kind of what the future of, of our involvement in skills looks like. I, I have to say, like, my impressions are higher like, than I had expected. Yeah. And I know you had told me that from your previous, mm -hmm. you know, involvement in skills. And, um, you know, until you're really there, you don't know. Yeah. So I think that this has been a great experience for me, the um, staff. for my yeah. staff, uh, you know, the, having something that uh, students can try mm -hmm. physically and where we've had the schools from the Winnipeg area, you know, come out and show their projects that are booth. 13,000 students over two days. That, that's yeah. attending. Yes. It, yeah. That's but <laughs> the students from like welding programs oh, right. coming to the booth, volunteering. volunteering. Yeah. Um, what's really cool is when you see them teaching their peers mm -hmm. how to use a simulator or, you know, that this project took me two weeks or our class did this big project and, you know, this is how it's being used in our community. Uh, like the, the whole gamut from kind of learning a skill through to, you know, how a course in welding can benefit your community and charitable, you know, this, this societal give backs. Yeah. Um, to me, that's really powerful. And, you know, the CWB, not to pump our horns, but like we are seen as a leader in the welding industry. We are kind of at one end of the spectrum, the invigilator, the, the you know, the, the one that's monitoring. I hate to say the word police, but... I was a welder, the police, for, <laughs> for the codes and standards. And that's, there's nothing wrong with policing. It's part of our industry. It's part yeah. of our success as a Canada. But there's an inherent risk that we have to take on in this type of not-for-profit organization. And that people will sometimes wait for us to make the first step. Because mm -hmm. we are seen as the leaders in the welding industry. So, so often you go out to the schools and you say, why are you know, they're, they're struggling with this, struggling with that. And they don't know what they don't know. They don't know the programs that are out there. They don't even know perhaps even some of our partners that That's could help true. them. And, you know, it's we we can't wait for them to ask. We have to find a way to, you know, diffuse that information out there, right? Absolutely. I think your podcasts are doing a great job of that, you know? Yeah. And there's lots of different ways. This is one that we're in here today. Mm -hmm. And with the foundation in that role, you know, simulator projects, a great one. How do you start that? Where do you know? How do you buy? What do you buy? When do you buy? How many? I mean, this, these are all things that, you know, there's going to be a learning curve there. Sure. And some of it's going to hurt a little bit. Yes, right? it does. <laughs> right? But this is the type of organization that people look at to kind of wait to make those mistakes to see how it works. And that gives them the confidence to be like, oh, well, you know, the foundation, they invested in three different types of machines. They can kind of tell us now 
which one we should buy instead of them making that mistake, which they they can't afford. Not that we want to mm-hmm. waste any money. It's an investment, right? Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm very lucky because I don't have a welding background, mm-hmm. but I have technical um, experts on my team mm-hmm. as well as across CWB. And I think it's, you know, as you said, we have to be able to take those risks, mm-hmm. learn from them, share what we learn, and continue continue to grow and build. So the simulator program, I think what's really working, um, and this was launched just about a year and a half mm-hmm. ago, um, and, you know, we're always concerned about risk management and mm-hmm. making sure everything we do is safe and we give the right, you know, some good background and training for, for simulation, just like we do in our camps. Um, I think the way we are working through trusted partner groups now across Canada is going to give us lots of great information in terms of what works and what doesn't work and how we can guide them going forward. But even more like that, they can connect with each other Mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are using the simulators and they're the, Mm -hmm. they're our engines for, you know, imparting that knowledge. So we're really just taking the first step and making the investment and setting them up for success. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, you know, here at skills, um, it's been interesting seeing all the different trades, the, the AI that they have for training and simulation everywhere. So it's, it's, um, it's our future and all the research that, you know, we see across around the world is showing, you know, that it can be very efficient. It can be a really mm-hmm. great icebreaker. Uh, it's icebreaker. Yeah. It's no risk. Um, you know, I've been at a, a school when, you know, a parent has come to me and say, you know, I'm afraid for my, my, my child to take welding because I don't know that it's safe. Mm-hmm. And yet they can, they can try a simulator and see if, you know, they have that interest. Yeah. And that proficiency potentially in, in just that innate hand to eye coordination mm-hmm. that might exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh it is, as you say, an an icebreaker. Yeah. Uh, so I think we probably see more of those types of programs in our future. Um the other program that we launched just this past year was our Weld Safe program. Right. Um, you know, we learned so much during the pandemic about the gaps in PPE that that schools have. Um, the, the safety knowledge that they have in terms of how they're setting up, maintaining their labs, um, you know, just all the things we were dealing with through the pandemic with respect to masking. And, uh, so we kind of pulled that all together and were able to launch this PPE class support. And now that's expanding to, um, be that applicable. Got big to, fast. It got so big, <laughs> so fast. You're right. I mean, our original goal was. Mm, I think we can budget to do to support 25 schools across <laughs> Canada. And uh, we had great sponsors come to the table mm. and partners and now CWB Consulting and the association. So it's just kind of <laughs> <laughs> growing well, like crazy. Everyone heard about it and everyone wanted it. Well, right? yeah. and you know, we are, we're thrilled. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, that, that was a really positive risk we took yeah. um, and really opened the door to really CWB's whole advocacy program in health and safety, yeah. public and school. Well, and it ties into all the other groups we work with, CSA, CISC. That's right. Then we have this whole circle of industry life in Canada. And, you know, we're the welding people, so we tie into everybody in some way. Right. And everyone has their rules and their game. But when it comes to health and safety, we're on the same field, right? Absolutely. The, um, the other thing is, you know, the foundation is really all about making social impact, excuse me, as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, reach those remote and less accessible areas. And um, we're also trying to support students in, with financial need. So whether it's skills and being able to start to make connections in areas that we haven't who don't know us because lots of areas still don't know about us um, Mm -hmm. or that we don't know, um, or it's the ability to be able to give a graduating student who has a potential job in welding or a post-secondary placement, but doesn't have the funds to, you know, spend $2,000 in getting all the PPE that they need. We can now do that. So that's, that's really special. I think. And, you know, as a, 
for the students out there that listen to the podcast, people that are looking to get into the trades, it takes a village. Yeah. It takes a village. So like, the foundation, they can offer parts. The association can offer parts. Private industry can offer parts. You know, all these pieces come together to make, you know, success get off the ground for people. The question is, how far do you feel the importance is or the partnerships or how, you know, necessary are this, is, is it for private industry to be involved? You know, as a not-for-profit, we, it's an edgy space that we work in yeah. because there's a lot of financial control. There's a lot of oversight of the money. Um, and it's not, not that it's less so in the private industry, but they have more access. Mm -hmm. They have the ability mm -hmm. to just go make more money if they want to, or we kind of don't have that necessarily ability where do you see that uh, private versus not-for-profit relationship? So I think it's a fantastic question. I think that, you know, we have a big role as being to be the connectors mm -hmm. between private industry and education. And um, I think that we do that. We do that in as many ways as we can, mm -hmm. right? Um, really getting the word out of the need. Um, you know, we have, as an example, we have a capital and equipment grant. Um, this year we had, uh, you know, over 80 applications for that. And I would say over 40 of them are, are not big asks of money. Mm -hmm. They're, these are classes that they're just are, trying to get they're through, trying to get through. And, and the other thing is they're seeing increased enrollment in their mm -hmm. welding classes, but they're not seeing their school budgets go up. So like, how do you supply your students with, welding rod and steel etc that has to come from somewhere so you know we see a big part of our job is trying to work with the teachers and uh, private industry to get more like of that leftover steel mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those you know just a little connecting bit with the recycling connecting and the people all those yeah, things yeah. all those things so i think i don't know how we're going to do it fully but i, I think I it's think a day by day it, thing like yeah you kind of the small to medium business aspect of Canada is huge right now. Entrepreneurship's yeah. up. You're seeing lots of small companies get started. I feel like this is the beginnings of connections for the next 30 years. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of massive companies that we love them. Thank you to the big companies that support us. Um, but, you know, we need to broaden our spectrum too. You're right. To, to the other companies that they don't have the $30,000 to give, but they maybe have $500 to give. But if you get 3,000 of them, you're in the same place. Yeah. Now managing that's tricky. Yes. <laughs> <But> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I think that uh, the other way that that's happening is that as the as the schools know about us and as we know about them, we know that teachers have enough on their plate mm -hmm. to do beside other than do, be fundraisers, right? So if we can help them by making those introductions to industry in their area. Um, through our big network of CWB people, then they can find and navigate and, and bring those um, those professionals in to talk to their students and to get yeah. engaged in career fairs and talk about jobs and you know what the future looks like, and as well give them a little bit of supply support. Yeah, you know the the education budgets unfortunately are not going up. You know, I've worked mm -hmm. in education. I think you, that was part of your, Me I, too, I want to talk, yeah. I want to ask about that <laughs> later, but you know, that's a space that, um, that I don't know. I don't know what needs to change in Canada, just in general, in the way we view education, mm -hmm. every single person in the world, you sit them down, you ask them one question, do you value education? 100%. No one says, no, are you willing to pay for it? That's where things get tricky. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's always that, that, that balance, you know, especially as an organization like us where we're not the trainers necessarily. We do have training programs. We do have mm -hmm. things that we offer, but we're really here in a supportive narrative to other established organizations that have, you know, wonderful training programs. You know, how can we make their lives easier, right? Mm -hmm. I think we just, we really have a role to play in building the case for support of mm -hmm. technical education and... Yeah. If we can build that case and advocate for that, you know, among among the influencers of government and policy, and ministries of education, labor, you know, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, and um, and be on the ground showing yeah. and demonstrating how that makes a difference um, and supports our economy, I think that's 
that's a big role we have to play. One of the conversations I heard earlier this week uh, was discussions about, and this actually came up in Maritech a few weeks ago, was the ROI on uh, education, which is a, you're kind of clashing two universes together when you start talking about ROIs on education and how the ROI on trades is so much lower than theoretical courses. For example, really? I'm surprised. So if you think about it, this is how it was explained to me. And I found it very interesting. This room that we're sitting in right now. Yes. How many welding booths could I put in here? Maybe six? Six, I would right? guess. Tops? Maybe. Are the ceilings high enough? No, <laughs> I'd have to put in some vent. I would have to invest serious money mm-hmm. to make this turn into a training space. Plus the instructor. And I can get how many students through in a, a year. It's a 34-week program for a pre They're coming out with a level two, so they're not even done. This is mm-hmm. not even a, a diploma yet. Um, they have a certificate. It's a full year, power consumption, and you get six students out. In this same space, how many graphic design students could I push through? Probably double that. Easy. I would suggest. Right. So if you're looking as, as a minister of education or as a education expert looking at budgets and you're looking at students, numbers of students, the ROI of dollars in from education, you know, I turn this into a law class. I can push, you know, 40 law students through here in a year. Well, I think I would look at it, though, from the other side, which is those, those graduates mm-hmm. getting good paying jobs and paying taxes yeah is there work is there work waiting (laughs) for them and we know that with welding the the gap in is continuing to grow Mm -hmm. um i'm on board with you 100 so i think we see the other side we have to (laughs) we have to make sure that that those people who have the money in their pocket see Mm -hmm. the other side as well and and those are narratives that we have to fight to say we understand you can graduate more students Mm -hmm. but are they the employees that Canada needs moving forward? And I think we've clearly established through what well, we see the reports. Yes. We need trades. And welding's a small piece, but there's 26,000 job openings for welders today. Today mm-hmm. in Canada, 83,000 mm-hmm. in the U.S. And if we can't fill those jobs, we can't support those industries. No. Our economy is not going to be globally and competitive. We don't have enough immigration it's a, this is a multi-pronged <laughs> thing that that you know and agencies like us and you know we got apprentice search we got skills we're all kind of have this you know kind of tickling in the back of our brains like we need all these kids to turn into tradespeople. Mm-hmm. like it's like i hope mm-hmm. you're having fun this week but everyone needs to actually be a tradesperson. like there's kind of no choice you're right <laughs> you're right for sure so let's talk a little bit about you know how you got to be in this role. Because in my experience, and I don't know your history, but in my experience, people that end up in not-for-profits start off in for-profits and then work their way into not-for-profits. Uh, kind I'm of, one of those people. Kind of a passion project. I was too. I come from private industry. I always volunteered. I had a spirit of volunteerism in my yeah. family home. So we were always like the marching for, you know, for rights or going on protests with like the downtown with whatever. My dad would drag me down there. And then volunteering at local everythings. Mm-hmm. So it's always been there. But I wanted to like make money. So I went off into the world to make money as a private industry. But then that not-for-profit bug, the volunteerism, keeps kind of following you around. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, initially when you went to college, you know, what did you go study? What what is it that you are educated in? So I'm a science nerd. Okay. Um, I was actually really good at math, but it was old math, not new math. Well, (laughs) math 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 doesn't change. It's just the way it gets (laughs) there. The way it taught has has changed significantly, but... Um, yeah, you know, I start at my background, my family's scientists and healthcare mm-hmm. people. And so I just naturally gravitated into that. Um, and then when I finished uh, an undergraduate degree, I decided to teach. My background what was, was um, biology, and, biology and mathematics, okay. actually, yeah. um, with a little bit of psych thrown yeah, in there, yeah. too. That's kind of the my electives. soft skills. <laughs> actually, it was probably what I did best at <laughs> and didn't expect to. But yeah, that was how I got yeah. there. I think that, um, so my, um, my passion growing up was sports. Mm -hmm. So I was a competitive figure skater and a swimmer. And, um, so I, and then I naturally got into coaching as a teenager Mm -hmm. and as a summer job, it was, uh, always really fun and you could be outside and, you know, meet other people Mm -hmm. and very social. So that coaching led me into 
teaching because I graduated and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And with it's not a lot of government work with a biology. No, and, and I didn't it's see myself like moving into the something. petrochemical industry, mm -hmm. which is where my hometown was. So, um, so teaching to me was kind of a natural, like, hmm, I'm going to do this uh, and uh, see where it goes. And, and through that, um, I think I really... So what kind of teaching were you doing? I was teaching high school chemistry and mm -hmm. biology and coaching track and field and cheerleading, yeah. actually. So where, what, where, what high school were you teaching? What's your... Uh, what's your my <laughs> uh, St. Patrick's yeah. High School in Sarnia, Ontario. Do you uh, still connect with them at all? Do you still cheer for them? You know what? The school actually more, uh, amalgamated with another school. The it's now a lot schools, bigger, yeah. and so. But I have a sister who's a, te a teacher and a retiring teacher mm -hmm. this year, um, and head of science and student success in that board of education. So nice. um, yeah, so I stay connected. Yeah. I have a brother who's a tech teacher in Kitchener, and I have a sis another sister who's. Um, uh, the first robotics lead and an English and French uh, teacher in Trinidad. So, is so we've got a lot a teacher? of teachers in my family with this generation, uh, my siblings. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I stay connected with the education world in, yeah. in that respect. But, well, how long did you teach in high school for? Um, three years. Three years. And then I decided I wanted to get a little more education mm -hmm. myself. Um, I was really young when I started teaching. I was only 21. I kind mm -hmm. of fast-tracked through high school. And, and um, so I felt like I was teaching alongside my own teachers. Yeah, and I didn't really yeah. have a peer group of my age. Um, and I kind of got a little bit disillusioned by teaching, I, I would yeah. say, um, for a few different reasons. Yeah. But, but anyway, it, it, was, it was tough. And, um, it, you know, there's... I, I, I love the fact that there are some really amazing teachers out there. And I find the tech teachers that we work with are all in that, mm -hmm. in, in that basket. But I, not everyone is. And it can be interesting when you kind of run into somebody who was your teacher and you see them in a different light. Yeah, they're, kind of, they're just mailing it in. Yeah. A little bit of that. But yeah. I mean, that's, but that's, that's, that's just work. That's work. That's every, that's every industry, industry and, yeah. and not to be, you know. Yeah, you got your champions and you got uh, your. The people who are so along for the ride. Yeah. 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 Um, so I really needed to find and be sure that, that some, I was doing something I was passionate about. Yeah. So that is what led me back into, um, well, private sector for a little while. So what you go back to school for? I did, did an MBA. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Get some, I had no business mm -hmm. acumen at all. So did that, and then I went into the financial services industry, doing really corporate communications and and uh, well, that M and A work. Well, terribly boring to me. Well, no, actually, <laughs> Was it fun? well, back then we didn't have all the technology <laughs> that we have now. To, it wasn't digitized. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I really liked that because I liked kind of learning about mm. the different um, industries that my group was supporting. Yeah, so. and you kind of get to see more of the bones, Got too. to see more yeah. what makes an organization successful and mm -hmm. what, uh, you know, what leadership is all about. Yeah. So, to me, that was just kind of another step in lifelong learning. And mm -hmm. then, you know, I, we decided to move from Toronto into back closer to home, started building a family and having, um, wanting to have connections for our kids with grandparents mm -hmm. and things like that. So, that was sort of the next step where I couldn't really do what I had been doing and went more into not-for-profit corporate relations work in, in academia. So, so for a college system? For, yeah, for the university. Western was in my, in my backyard. Okay. Yeah. And um, so went into the kind of corporate development and that, that led me into fundraising and campaigns and uh, that aspect of Now, of fundraising in university is a serious game. Yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and I, I watch sometimes and you can really tell the universities and colleges across the country that have a really strong fundraising team. They have, the money they can pull in from industry is amazing. And then you see the ones that don't. And you're like, mm, mm. <laughs> how was your college? Good? Yeah. Uh, one of the best, yeah, I would say. Yeah, I've heard good things. Um, so. And, you know, I think there's some really interesting parallels between that world and the world we're in now. 
um, because to be a successful fundraising organization in in um, the university or academic environment, you really rely on the connections you have with your alumni, mm-hmm. right? And uh, they make introductions. You uh, you you know you build their support. And that just continues to mushroom into the sectors that they work in and that influences your strategic plan and, uh, you know, just how you see yourself and what, you know, how you fit into the the macro world. And I think that's kind of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're working Mm -hmm. with our, you know, with professionals in our space, with educators in our space, with businesses and kind of building that case. Awesome. Well, this is a perfect time to transition to a commercial. Let's get a break in for our sponsors and, and people that support the association. So stay tuned here. I'm with Susan Crowley from the CWB Welding Foundation. We'll be right back after this short word from our supporters. The CWB Association is new and improved and focused on you. We offer a free membership with lots of benefits to anyone interested in joining an association that is passionate about welding. We are committed to educating, informing, and connecting our workforce. Gain access to your free digital publication of the Weld Magazine, free online training, conferences, and lots of giveaways. Reach out to your local CWB Association chapter today to connect with other welding professionals and share welding as a trade in your community. Build your career, stay informed, and support the Canadian welding industry. Join today and learn more at cwbassociation.org. And we are back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max. I'm here with Susan Crowley from the CWB Welding Foundation. Right before the break, we were talking about Susan's journey in her academic life and working into the private world, getting into the private, and then into the universities, learning about the fundraising aspects. And at that point, we had just stepped off. <laughs> so from there, you know, you're working at Western. You're having, you're fun. I love working for colleges is a blast. You, great, yeah. you meet great people. There's lots of quirky teachers with great ideas and lots of fun people. You know, what pulled you out of there? Where did you go from there? Um, well, actually, I was um, recruited from there to move over to the University of Waterloo, mm-hmm. which you might know their brand is the most innovative mm-hmm. um, university in Canada and very much a tech um, and uh, kind of my wheelhouse of uh, skills uh, organization. Mm-hmm. And just what I really, um, I found a real connection to their fundraising campaign and moved there and worked there for about seven years oh, good. and um, yeah, got very involved in kind of more future oriented uh, change yeah. and strategic planning and, and collaboration mm-hmm. between a very decentralized organization um, at the time mm-hmm. and so I had a great time uh, yeah. there um, and then Decided that, you know, I I was on the road a little too much and wanted to be closer At to home. home. Yeah. And um, so moved into healthcare uh, as an opportunity came to join a board of my local okay. hospital yeah. and and then get involved in fundraising for um, the children's hospital. Okay. Um, well, that's in my deal. in my back gra- backyard. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, did that for a few years um, and then. Kind of decided to uh, really try to set up my own business, yep. and uh, so I set up a consulting organization called Market Science. Market Science and Sounds uh, cool. strategic Does it still planning, exist? fundraising. Did you sell it? Does no, it, no? I, it, it's not much to sell. <laughs> <laughs> a notepad and a phone number. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's it was really kind of my my launch into mm-hmm. um, you know my own business development and. Uh, I did a lot of contracts in education and uh, the not-for-profit world with startups and strategic planning and fundraising campaigns. And one of those ended up being the CWB Welding Foundation. Oh, yeah, with uh, with Deborah Mates. Yes, yeah. yes. So with Deb, I um, uh, had to step away for a while, and they asked me if I would come in on a temporary basis. And um, so Which, I thought, how do I business, go into welding? <laughs> Yeah, so um, started as a 10-week project 
and um, you know, lucky for me, it just turned yeah. into and like you know, Deborah never came really years. back, right? So no, although no. she's still doing wonderful, I still see her and you know chat with her online on Facebook and oh, that's great. Yeah, no, she's still doing great. No, she's up there with her kids and grandkids and mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's interesting actually connecting at skills now and. Uh, meeting some people who said, oh, I knew your predecessor. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, she had an interesting um, time when it, really the startup of yeah, the foundation, just inception, right? Yeah. Inception. And, you know, it was the CWB Group's dream. Mm-hmm. And uh, she made it a reality. And, you know, this year, Max, is our 10 year anniversary. Yeah. So, um, yeah, hoping that we can bring her back for a few conversations. Well, you actually. know, that's uh, the now. Like you inherited a legacy. Like there's shoes to fill, right? I yeah. I came after Dan Tadic. I mean, this whole world knows Dan Tadic. It's <laughs> tough to come in after like that. How did it feel for you now with the history you have, the background you have, but not welding? You know, but you understand all the other pieces of kind of what a foundation should do, you know. And you're coming in, you know, you have an established brand established by somebody else, and everyone always has their own mm-hmm. twist on it. Mm-hmm. How was that transition in for you f- into the foundation? Um, it must well, have been a bit of a shock. A it was a, definitely. I mean, I what I love is I'm learning about it every day. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember, I remember my first experience really showing how much of a dolt I was in <laughs> welding, and that you know, um, one of my uh, tools at home broke a metal thing. Mm-hmm. Thing. I'll just I won't go into details. It's too embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, I thought, oh. Maybe I'll just bring that to Milton with me today and I'll see if somebody in the lab can fix it. Mm -hmm. And they just started breaking up (laughs) laughing and said, that's not welding. Like, that's solder. (laughs) And I'm going, oh, like I didn't know there was a difference. difference? (laughs) Oh, and I thought, oh, I'm never going to live this down, right? Yeah. Um, But uh, from there, I think, you know, one of the things that really was being tested um, and there were a lot of different perspectives on it when I joined, mm-hmm. was the value of our mind over metal camps. Mm-hmm. You know, we were doing and a lot like of right those. From the beginning, yeah. And they, they really were, like right out of the gate, mm-hmm. a signature program of the foundation. Well, I helped run one of the first ones ever at South Poly, like in the country. We were like a guinea pig with them. Wow. So, so they, were, they were under a lot of mm-hmm. serious review uh, what, from, you know, ROI perspective. Yeah. From, you know, safety and risk management, you know, cost, how do you deliver them? Yeah. You know, who gets them when? All those things. And, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of a year in, there was really some strong sentiment that we shouldn't be doing these anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm really thrilled at how we survived the pandemic. We were able to pivot and do some other things, yeah. you know, because we couldn't deliver the face-to-face programming and they've come back stronger than ever. Yeah, And there's more there, types of camps. There's right? more types. There's, yeah. you know, we've moved into pre-employment mm-hmm. camp type workshop programs. We're able to really focus on different special, special groups and populations, programs for women so I think really that was the impetus for like mm-hmm. so much of our growth and I'm really proud of my team and, and you know, the broader group that help us deliver those programs. Well, and I think it's, there's a streamlining process that was inherent in the beginning with the foundation, with, with me working from the foundation, from the other side of the fence, it was all these amazing ideas, but there was like, we didn't know what anything was going to cost or, mm-hmm. so I remember running the first mind over metal camps and it was like, Oh, you have a, you know, $3,500 budget. You blow through that <laughs> like in eight seconds and For like, sure. oh, okay, so that didn't work. Okay. We need way more. Like, yeah. And then you start realizing the cost of these camps to actually run. And then you start thinking, okay, well, if I set up 20 camps, how can that lower costs? Because mm-hmm, either mm-hmm. either you're in for a penny or you're in for a pound kind of thing. You know what I mean? Because if you just do one, it's too expensive. But if you do t- a ton, it brings the cost down. But now you're on the hook for a ton. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. H- how do you navigate yeah. those waters? Um, I really think it's all about managing expectations, mm-hmm. both of like the community that's going to be the beneficiary of the camp and also of the sponsor of the camp. Because... Mm-hmm. These aren't just packages that you buy off a shelf, yeah. right? And there's so much behind delivering these programs. There's so much of people's time, 
volunteerism, um, really customization. Um, so managing expectations on all sides so that everyone mm -hmm. understands the value. That's Even internally coming. to the people we have to, yes. you know, be, be accountable to. That's, right? that's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> we both know. Yeah. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, that's the key to success. Um, getting a handle on what they really cost has been mm -hmm. interesting and, you know, costs have gone up, mm -hmm. um, just like everything else. Right. So, yeah. um, we're kind of, uh, you know, we definitely want to do more of them. We need to be able to really strengthen our impact reporting so that we can bring on more sponsors mm -hmm. to deliver our camps and where we see like the great opportunity now that. You know, we've got that and it is such a like such a mainstay of strong what brand. we do it's and a strong, strong brand. brand. Yeah. Thank you. That that um, you know, how do we package that um in an area that needs welders? So yeah. we're look trying to look at things like re from regionally across Canada, what industry needs and you know, camps are a big part of kind of starting the process of uh training and, and recruitment. Yeah. But then, you know, we also look at, you know, how are the schools set up? Um, you know, how's industry involved? Um, are, do the educators need training? Um, are, are there some gaps from an industry, a company's perspective that they're trying to recruit yeah. and what there's some skills that are mean? missing? Yeah. And, and so that's something we, a couple of years ago, branded the sparking success model mm -hmm. and where we're going to go into an into a region and have a camp but also support them for three to five years mm -hmm. with a range of programs and services and bring in cwb group and other external partners to support them too that's a very tricky thing to do mm -hmm. uh, the tracking the traceability of success long term over career now we're complaining about something that no one even else has. The electricians, the plumbers, the carpenters, they don't even have an association. They don't even have the ability to do what we do. Welding is very privileged to have, you know, associations and foundations that are supporting them. But from our end, it's like, how do we know where it's working? Yes. How do we yeah. know it's working? And even though like on a fundamental level, we know it is, but mm -hmm. it's very hard to put those kind of intangible things into a tangible report to say you know we trained 300 people this year 40 of them became welders in five years that would be a win you know but i don't yeah. know is it to whose standard you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah no i mean you're talking my language because that's <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's what our board is asking mm -hmm. for and and what our you know our donor base and what government's asking mm -hmm. us to do, help them do um to move the needle right yeah. increase the number of women going into the trades and welding specifically um you know fill the skills gap um so it's you know it's really impossible to follow somebody from the age of 12 until they are 21 <laughs> yeah. you know even though our world is and then learning. exactly yeah. Yeah. um so now that we've been around for 10 years we're starting to be able to Get some measures of the impact of the foundation mm -hmm. through our survey recently completed a survey of secondary educators uh, really thrilled with um, the participation rate we had that mm -hmm. so we went out to those those educators we know who stay connected with us and have been supported by or been part of our programs and we had a 41 percent response rate wow. which i think was really good yeah usually it's like 26 is like the Anything over 26 is considered awesome. Yeah. So, you know, that's yeah. the start of something. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're really, our results are based on what they qualitatively think has been the benefit more than quantitatively. But it's a start. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the things we're trying to instill in all of our, our partners is just how they are part of our success. It's not just us sparking success. It's how can they help us to measure the impact of what yeah. we're doing? Now, when we look at the funnel, you know, one of the things that I think that us, Canada, governments in general, have been doing very well for the last, I'd say, five, six years 
is really creating the awareness and pushing in people into the top of the funnel, getting the like the mass numbers to just be there, sign up, get involved, try or try it, right? I think that now focuses are starting to shift into retention, mm-hmm. longevity, establishment of careers, and not even and even to further that, you know, uh, growth of careers, upskilling, mm-hmm. working mm-hmm. into leadership positions, perhaps mm-hmm. entrepreneurship, business, or whatever. Where do you feel your focus is going to be, say, in the next three to five years with the foundation in terms of staying at the top, getting people in the door, working on the middle group of upskilling and training and getting them in, or at the third tier, which is helping people aspire into higher paying jobs or higher mm-hmm. levels of, of ownership of company? You know, um, where do you see that? Because you're kind of playing within all three For spaces a little, a little bit. A little right? bit in all three yeah. um, Right now, our focus, though, is going to continue on being, you know, the top of the funnel. Yeah. Um, it's really the awareness through to pre-employment. That's our, I would say, you know, 80, mm-hmm. 90% of our focus. Um, where I think we can play a role, but we're not the lead, is in facilitating those connections that we're building through our contacts in industry, our contacts with educators, both secondary and post-secondary, our contacts and work with uh, our labor organizations to help help them with the referrals, I would yeah, say. Sustainability and of that sustainability. Career, yeah. Referrals into um, organizations that have other career advancement programming, whether they be welding or soft skills mm-hmm. or leadership training or you know, areas such as quality control and inspector training. Or even sales. Like we're talking to the guys at Very, Lincoln that's last night. That's a great night, one, yeah. You know, and Lincoln will take a Red Seal welder over anything else and pay them amazing money to be a sales rep because who knows better how to sell welding machines than a welder? That's the great analogy. Right, yeah. and, and I, I look at some of these careers. I have two very close friends that were Red Seal welders making great money who are now salespeople. And I would have never thought that as a career mm-hmm. path. It would have, mm-hmm. In my mind, and this is total bias, it's like a step down, but it's not. This is just a different career path, mm-hmm. period, right? It's a different type of influence that yeah. they can have because they have that background. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think that, you know, we want to continue to build our network and understand what those needs are and what those opportunities are for for people who are, you know, moving through their careers, mm-hmm. advancing through their, their careers. Um, but we're not the experts in, in creating the programs for yeah. them. That's where we look to, to others. Well, and I know even at, like association, even pre-CWB, it, we were seen as the cradle to the grave. You know, like well, as soon yeah. as you get the job, you come to us because now you're a welder, right. you know, and now we can help support you till the day you retire. You know, once we got pulled into CWB, I think the focus is the same, but now we have to navigate that space with other groups. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like the foundation, I think, is very much top of funnel into mid. And I think they have the ability to create any type of program. It could be second, third tier of funnel, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. development. Um but how do we coordinate? How do we coordinate with certification, which is seen as the certification is your, your principal path to making more money, right. better jobs. Right. How do we work with education, which is now seen as the leader in training of resources? Mm-hmm. You know, so there's a lot of moving pieces, right? It's true. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we we are very much supported by the CWB group. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I need to be able to deliver value and help with business development opportunities for my partners, Mm -hmm. uh, all of them. And uh, so I think that it's interesting to kind of look 10 years out and say, well, if we want to, if we're successful, then people are going to know who CWB is across, across Canada, across North America, and um, especially in specific industry sectors, mm-hmm. right? And we have a role to play in, you know, advancing the cause. Of, yeah. So. And letting them know, this is my pitch to the listeners, <laughs> but letting them know that it's an investment. It's not a cost. It's an investment. You know, we are at our core a not-for-profit, the whole company. Yes, we have a for-profit side, but that's not the lion's share of what we do. So 
in a, in this space, yes, we take your money for many things. I had to pay. I still pay for my CWP tickets. I don't get for, I don't get them for free now that I work at the company. So like you have. I to, don't have any of yeah, them. Yeah. <laughs> so you, I've been paying into this entity for thirty years, and there's a, a lack of information out there to know that this is an investment. It's just not an, a, a fee that I'm paying off into the universe. This is an investment into the company, which then reinvested into my own industry. And this is why we are able to maintain the level of success we have. Mm -hmm. So I think people learning about the foundation and knowing like that's where my dollars go is important. Yeah. It's an important piece to know. It's not just like, oh, they get money from the government or they get, no, they actually get money from welders pockets. That's not a bad thing. You're paying into something. I mean, I pay for my place. I don't get any money out of that. I mm -hmm. pay for groceries. I don't get any money out of that. But if I pay for my certifications for welding, I could help with my own kid's education. In, you know, through yeah. a, a back, you know. That's right. The, I mean, I, the other thing, I, I, the case that I make, Max, is that, you know, our success is based on our ability to leverage that money, mm -hmm. right? Um, so statistically, like for every dollar that we spend directly investing in a camp or a grant to our student award, um, we have to generate, or our goal is to, generate at least two and a half times that amount mm -hmm. and we've been pretty successful so because we're in those communities um and and we're supporting um you know a welding lab refit or whatever in a secondary school we're helping that school to bring money in from their board mm -hmm. from the ministry from industry in their area and uh you know gifts in kind or you kind know whatever the wagons you just thing, really yeah. you know it's kind of building the case mm -hmm. and uh i think that's you know a big part of our role is communication just like yours uh yeah. just like all of us in, you know supporting the trades we're really we're telling the story yeah. that brings brings more people uh into into the fold the, really yes yeah, that's yeah, it yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been awesome. Let's wrap it up. We're here okay. with a couple final questions. You know, I think everyone got to learn a little bit about you, about the company, you know, how it's going. But let's 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 look at it in a, in a couple ways. We're here at Skills Canada, yes. and we're talking about essential skills, skills for success. You know, your career has taken a few paths, right, from being yes. the science <laughs> nerd out of high school and, you know, taking university, switching into there. But from there to today, what would you say would be the one – or two definitive skills that you had to develop to ensure your success? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, I'd say I think everyone now is uh, in our world is, is a, needs to be a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I hope that I can call myself a lifelong learning, you know, mm -hmm. professional advocate, yeah. advocate <laughs> yeah. because um, our world is changing so fast. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that would be number one, just being open to learning new things mm -hmm. is, is critically important. Um, and I think that message needs to get out to our young people. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is really confidence. You yeah. know, it, it's really, um, we need to, you know, instill self-confidence and self-awareness and, and bravery in, um, mm -hmm. in our students and just go I mean, for it, it. it yeah. yeah i mean it it's nerve-wracking for me doing something like a podcast yeah. i'm not an extroverted person yeah but uh so that's something that you know i have to continue yeah, to work on karaoke last night so <laughs> no I, I, I didn't lose my voice but yours is coming back are you ready for well, another yeah, night no, of it I, i'm absolutely i'll be ready i'm always i'm bulletproof so absolutely <laughs> No, thank you, Max. Yeah. It's been fun being on. Well, and, and the last question I got oh, for you. More. <laughs> this is the one I end every podcast on. All right. So let's say we have a time machine. Okay. And you're able to, with everything you know today, as of right this moment, you're able to teleport yourself to say a 14 year old Susan. You're 14 years old. You're not quite out of high school. You have some ideas. You see your parents' careers and you got a th some thoughts about what you want to do. What piece of advice would you give past Susan from today? Be open-minded. Yeah. Just be open to trying new things and going outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Push the boundaries a bit. Yep. Good. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Susan, for being on the show. Very much appreciate it. Any shout-outs? Anything you want to say to your your family or, oh, or public, gosh. your uh, fans? I really want to thank my team. Um, 
you know, I've got an amazing team uh, at the foundation who's really passionate about what they do, um, really believe in skills and mm -hmm. believe in welding as a gateway to all of the skill trades. So mm -hmm. I feel like we've got, uh, you know, a lot of power behind us. And um, so I want to definitely thank them. I really want to thank all the teachers um, and the teachers who really take an interest in in their students and not not just their students in general but they they look for and they seek out that student who's having trouble mm -hmm. and they really make it a personal mission to yeah, help that find, student find be successful yeah, yeah. So. awesome well it's fantastic and like i said thank you for being on the show and taking your time today thank you Mark. Awesome. it's been fun Awesome. Well, and for all the people that have been following along, you know, this one is going to be part of our normal series. So thank you for sticking with the podcast and making it such a success that it has been. Remember to click, download, and share the podcast to everyone. Let everybody know that it's out there. Put in the comment sections what you think about the episode, which is your favorite, what you liked, didn't like. And if you have any suggestions for people that want to be on the podcast or yourselves, reach out to us anytime through Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, or everywhere. You can't not find us. Just type in CWB. We pop up first. So that's where we are. And stay tuned for the next episode. We hope you enjoy the show.